Welcome everyone, this is uh, Jakarta EE, Present and Future. Uh, my name is Reza Rahman. In my day job, I'm Principal Program Manager for Java and Azure at Microsoft. Um, today's talk, though, doesn't really have much to do with my day job. Today, I'm here on behalf of the Jakarta EE Ambassadors, as you can see from um, the slide template. Uh, in fact, uh, I will, I'll talk a, a bit about what the Jakarta EE Ambassadors are. Uh, beyond this talk simply being more or less, uh, if you will, a State of the Union for Jakarta EE, one aspect of this talk is actually to invite you uh, to be involved uh, in, in Jakarta EE and begin to contribute to Jakarta EE, um, maybe uh, through the Jakarta EE ambassadors. Uh, either way, uh, on the screen, I do have my contact information. I'm relatively easy to get a hold of. Uh, if you have any questions on any of the content that I'll, I present today, um, please uh, do feel free to reach out back, back out to me and I'll try to help you, uh, obviously, in any which way that I can. So let's go ahead and get started with the talk. Uh, and the best place to get started is a basic introduction of Jakarta EE, just in case you haven't heard of it before. Uh, Jakarta EE is basically the technology that uh, used to be called Java EE. Uh, it is now transitioned from the JCP uh, to the Eclipse Foundation uh, under the name Jakarta EE. Uh, there's nothing in particular wrong with the JCP. In fact, uh, I've been involved with uh, Java EE for a very long time in the JCP, and my experience in the JCP has been, I, I think, by and large positive. But the reality, though, uh, is that the JCP really is not a, ultimately a vendor-neutral organization. In fact, it is not an organization per se in, in, a, in any real sense. It's just a department in Sun, and uh, now it's a department in, in Oracle. So it is definitely uh, far short of uh, what the vendor-neutrality benchmarks today it really is. Whereas the Eclipse Foundation and Jakarta EE uh, is, in fact, what you would imagine to be open source and vendor neutral today. Uh, it's a, a non-profit organization. It does not do anything. It's, it's not affiliated with any particular company per se. Um, so all of the all of the IP, all of the code is completely in open source and not uh, in controlled by any particular corporate entity. In fact, everyone really has a level playing field, certainly in terms of Jakarta EE. So under Jakarta EE, you have open governance, you have open source, you even have open compatibility testing. Under the JCP, when you wanted to certify something uh, as Jakarta EE compatible, ultimately you needed to pay uh, Sun or Oracle some amount of money to get the compatibility test or, uh, test or TCK. So you no longer need to do any of that anymore. The, even the compatibility test testing is much more self-service than it, that it once than it once used to be. However, though. Uh, in the transition process, we did preserve uh, what is actually important in, in, in terms of uh, Java EE as an open standard. So there's still a well-defined specification process. There is still very clear IP flow of, of where the IP really belongs, in particular in the collective ownership of IP, uh, and the vendor neutrality. Right? The, the, it, is, it is really um, well defined to be vendor neutral uh, and a level playing field for all of us. In fact, a level playing field even for individuals. One of the hopes that we all had uh, while moving Java EE to Jakarta EE is actually uh, making things uh, a level playing field even for developers, even for individuals, uh, so that we all can also participate uh, in, in the definition and advancement of, of these open standards and open specifications. So that, I would say, has not really happened. And, and in fact, if there's one thing that I'd like to change going forward, uh, and hopefully even by delivering this talk, that's what I would like to try to accomplish. But the good news is that uh, the key stakeholders that were involved in Jakarta EE, that, that are involved in Java EE, that are still involved in Jakarta EE, so Oracle is still involved, IBM, Payara, Pivotal, Red Hat, all of those all of those names, they are still they are still continuing to contribute. In fact, they are contributing in a much more <coughs> equal way as compared to what it had what had been the case uh, under the JCP with uh, perhaps Sun stewardship and stewardship and then Oracle stewardship. So the key that we would like to solve, uh, and I hope uh, if you take away anything from this talk at all, uh, it is this particular point, is that right now and going forward, what is actually key and what is possible is community participation and contribution. So if you want to find out anything much more about Jakarta EE beyond the little bit of, a, of an introduction that I, I just gave you, and hopefully for most of you this is um, old hat, you know, stuff you already know about, but if you want to learn more, the best place to do that is a really nice URL called jakarta.ee, and you can go find more about 
drug card A starting from that website. Okay, so uh, before we move too far ahead, I did want to talk a little bit about the importance of Jakarta E. So one of the uh, unfortunate things about Jakarta E is there's, uh, frankly speaking, a lot of negative marketing around it. Now, some of it is warranted. Some of it was are warranted back in the J2E days, more or less, much less so these days. And frankly, a lot of it really is just negative marketing. And what I attribute to that being is that there's a lot of money to be made. And wherever there's money to be made, there's some people that will always fall into the trap of um, utilizing negative marketing as a tactic. So they'll tell you, oh, it's not relevant, uh, you know, so on and so forth. But it's very far from the truth. Right? When you look at the objective numbers, uh, especially when you talk to developers, and, and in my day job, I certainly do, there's real people using this technology set that uh, mission critical applications are still dependent upon. In fact, if you look at some of these numbers, and one of the numbers that you can cite here is the Jakarta e developer survey, arguably probably the most important survey for Jakarta e developers. But even if you look at overall and you amortize it uh, through the rest of the uh, industry, uh, industry surveys out there, depending on which survey you look at, about 25 to 35% of applications are still using like a full Jakarta e compatible runtime. So Wildfly, JBoss, CAP, WebLogic, WebSeared, Liberty, Payara, a bunch of people using this stuff today. So obviously this is a technology set that relevant that is relevant to those folks. In fact, if you look at the Jakarta developer survey, you'll see the higher end number, which is about 35%. Now, let's assume for a moment that you're not using a Jakarta E server. Does that mean that, oh, it, this is a technology set that doesn't matter to you anymore? Well, that is also very far from the truth because the reality is uh, a vast majority of people that are Java developers are using and are dependent upon the health and well-being of these technology sets. So about 70 to 80% of Java applications depend at least directly or indirectly a, against at least one and most likely more than one, a sizable number of technologies from Jakarta E. So whether you're using Spring or Tomcat or Hibernate or ActiveMQ or Jetty or Microfile and Quarkus, Believe it or not, at the end of the day, Jakarta is something that is important to you. And hence, you should be paying attention to the health and well-being of this technology set. Making this technology set healthy will is what is going to guarantee the longevity of Java, not just for the next 20 years, but maybe in the next 50 years. But that does not happen you know, if we do not pay attention to this technology set, because it is fundamental to keeping the ecosystem healthy and competitive. Now, this is also a ecosystem that is evolving. Okay, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so there is a micro profile has paid and played an important role and enjoys relatively decent adoption, uh, even, in, even in terms of Java E and Jakarta E developers, perhaps even beyond. Uh, and of course, there are other evolving parts of the ecosystem that also play a very, very important role. So these are things like Quarkus and Heliden and uh, maybe even Micronaut down the line. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about uh, the concept of Jakarta E core profile. Okay, so very, very important technology set. So as we know, Jakarta E is not new. Uh, it started its life actually something called JPE. I don't even know how many people remember this anymore. Uh, I'm happy to say I've been part of this, uh, part of this journey for a very long time myself. Um, you know, I've been involved essentially since the J2E 1.4 days in one way or the other. And of course, I've been involved uh, in developing this technology set uh, ever since at least Java E6, uh, to some extent even Java E5. So for me, this has been a very important part of my own personal journey. Uh, and of course, we've seen many evolutions. And this is, this is, in fact, a technology set that is evolving and has been evolving and continues to evolve. So Jakarta e, Java E8 was the last uh, release that was uh, under the under the uh, under the JCP, and I think it is a still a very foundationally important release. I'll talk about in a second why that is. Uh, and then there was Jakarta E8, and uh, Java E8 and Jakarta E8 are basically binary compatible releases. Um, they're exact same technology set. The only difference is one is released by the JCP, and the other is released by the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, and now the current set is Jakarta EE9, and I'll talk about more about Jakarta EE9 and 9.1 in a moment, but that is the current release. And what we are looking at now, and hopefully we will uh, see a release of in, in early, in, in just a few months now, 
uh, is Jakarta E10. And that is what is going to bring uh, new enhancements and new features. So uh, uh, Jakarta E9 so far is really has been about the namespace transition and moving things properly from the JCP into uh, into uh, into the Eclipse Foundation. Now we'll begin to see again uh, the the uh, technology set re revise itself and add more innovations toward it. Okay, so I think our story will not be complete if we don't talk about uh, Jakarta E8. So Jakarta E8 was a very very important release, and it was a community driven release as well. I was involved in how the uh, how the scope for Jakarta E8 was actually defined, and it was defined by a community survey. So as a result, what happened was uh, Jakarta E8 is actually a very very solid foundation. It's a very feature complete release, uh, especially if you're developing monolithic applications more or less. Okay, so that is one of the reasons why uh, even uh, uh, accounting for the fact that it has taken some effort and it's a very significant effort to move things from the JCP to the Eclipse Foundation to Jakarta EE. Uh, Java EE developers really has no, have not been wanting for very much. It's, it is because Java EE 8 was actually a very solid feature complete release. It is also because of microprofile. Okay, so uh, we, we all knew that this transition process was going to take some time. Uh, and what we needed to do is address uh, the gaps of, for, for applications that are microservices applications. And that is why MicroProfile was created in order to accelerate the development uh, of this technology set and meet the demands of Java E developers while the transition from Java E to Jakarta E was happening. So looking back, uh, Jakarta E8, its major themes were web standards alignment. So a lot of things to keep the platform relevant from a web development standpoint and um, with alignment with standards that come from bodies like W3C. Uh, so these are things like HTTP2, service sent events, adding JSON to the platform as a first class binding option, just like we have support for Java serialization and things like XML. JSON pointer, JSON patch. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, even JavaScript and JSON actually are standards, right? So these are things that are essentially bindings of those standards uh, built in into Jakarta E, built into Java. CDI alignment. Um, so this is gradually moving away from the HIV component model and centralizing the component model uh, in terms of CDI. CDI 2 was a very major release. CDI 4 is going to be another major release that is coming, um, coming in Jakarta E 10. Uh, pruning, you know, sort of redundant things like JSF managed beans, um, some older parts of EJB, um, making more and more of the of the uh, parts of the platform aligning with CDI. So things like uh, CDI support in, in persistence, converters in particular, and validators, uh, making the platform more and more simple wherever it is that we can, whether that's through pruning the old technologies like EJ, some parts of EJB or uh, adding a, a brand new security API to modernize security. That's another important thing that happened in Jakarta E8. Uh, and of course, one of the more, most important things that Java, Java E has always done is to take innovations in Java SC and sort of bring it to the enterprise Java space. One of the biggest uh, examples of this is annotations. I don't know how many people are, are aware of this, uh, but really it was Java E5 that showed the way, paved the way of, of how to really take annotations and make them work in a, in a server-side framework development environment. Similarly, uh, same thing has happened with Jakarta E8. Um, so it did a lot of work to align with Java SC8, which was a very important release. So it, it uh, included a number of important changes, things like repeatable annotations, the datetime API, streams, completable features. So all of those uh, changes were really absorbed into uh, the various specifications like faces, persistence, rest, and bean validation so that you can take advantage of those Java SC features uh, in server-side or microservices environments. So Jakarta E9 and Jakarta E9.1 is mostly about transitioning the namespace. So obviously, because of copyright reasons, uh, we could not continue to make use of the name Java. So we had to come up with a new name, Jakarta. I think it's a, actually a very significant name. Uh, if you, if I don't know how many people of you are aware of this, but Tomcat was essentially donated by uh, Sun Microsystems back in the day uh, as part of the Jakarta project. Okay. 
So Jakarta is a very significant name, and I think it's a very good name. But in order to, in, in addition to making a change to the name, we also needed to make a change to the namespace. So we really had to decouple ourselves from uh, the word Java uh, uh, in order to move this technology forward in, into the open source domain. So 9.1 did exactly that. So this is about moving all of the namespaces from Javax to Jakarta, all in one go. It's just a one-time tra transition process um, that you need, that you need to, well, we all need to undergo. Uh, remove, some other things also happened with Jakarta E9. Uh, one important thing was uh, in, is uh, upgrading the Java version. Okay, so uh, upgrading the Java version to SE11 as opposed to Java SE8, which is what was Java, what was Java E8. Uh, and in Jakarta E10, it's going to be uh, pro probably baselining on uh, 17, perhaps, right? or at least making it possible so that most applications can be written to Java SE 17. So this is all done at this point, um, and there's a lot of runtimes that actually support Jakarta E9 9 and 9.1 already, and we should all be beginning to think about uh, migrating in, in, into our namespaces. In fact, a lot of uh, the parts of the ecosystem have, have already done it. Tomcat, Jetty, Spring, um, certainly the Java E compatible runtimes, they've already completed the transition. So now it's your turn to do it. So uh, one of the very nice things that has happened is that we have actually grown the number of Java E and Jakarta E implementations uh, for, as compared to Java E8 and, and Jakarta E9 now. So all of those are actually listed in, in uh, this website that I have referenced. Uh, but the most important thing is that per perhaps is that uh, again we haven't lost anyone in this transition process so all of the runtimes that were there before they are uh, still supporting jakarta e uh, jakarta e and jakarta e9 going forward so that will continue to be the case in fact uh, i'll talk about this in a moment but hopefully we will be adding an entirely new class of jakarta e runtimes very very soon also hopefully in the jakarta e10 time frame in this year so uh, obviously that's current state so far. Um, now let's talk uh, and take a look a little bit into the near future. Uh, and the near future uh, is obviously Jakarta E10. So in the Jakarta E ambassadors, and, and we'll talk about the Jakarta E ambassadors in, in a moment now. I think this is a good uh, point, point to talk about that. So the Jakarta E ambassadors were originally called the Java E guardians. Um, and actually our purpose was to ensure uh, especially when, as we were observing that uh, uh, that there were some issues with Oracle in terms of its willingness to support Java EE, um, um, that is what that's the problem that we tried to solve. Tried to solve, and that is why we came into being as the Java EE guardians. And of course, we succeeded in that. Uh, you know, ultimately, Java EE eight was released, uh, and even ultimately, you know, all of the technologies that moved to the Eclipse Foundation now, where everybody can can contribute to it. So uh, with the renaming of the technology, we also renamed ourselves uh, from the Java E uh, Guardians to the Jakarta E Ambassadors. Uh, and basically what we were doing is that we were observing that, okay, it's going to take some time for this technology transition process to happen. We all knew that. Uh, it's a very, very large code donation. It's well into millions of lines and not even going into the huge amounts of IP transfer. It's perhaps the largest technology transfer that was successfully undertaken um, perhaps ever in, in our industry, certainly in the history of Java. Uh, so we knew that this is going to take some time. So one answer was to move forward microprofile, and that was all good. But in addition to that, what we wanted to do in the Jakarta Ambassadors is really put down our thoughts and collect thoughts from the community as to what we would like to see in terms of technology innovations in the platform. So in order to do that, and again, in order to encourage all of you to begin to contribute to ours as this technology set, we created something called the Jakarta E10 Contributor Guide. And in fact, it is still existing out there. And that is basically a listing of <clears throat> all of the possible changes, possible important changes to the Jakarta E platform that we would like to see. And in fact, a lot of these things are, are going to make it into, I'm very happy to say, is going to certainly make it into Jakarta E10. If it doesn't, it's going to probably make it into Jakarta E11. So uh, if you take, I'll, I'll let you take a look at the uh, the contributor guide yourself. It, it's out there for you as a resource. I'll just summarize um, at a high level what is in the in the contributor guide. 
uh, and also uh, what all, what what you can expect in Jakarta E10 and Jakarta E11 and what is actually happening. So one key theme is further CDI alignment. So it's again taking those uh, features that are uh, in in EJB and done in EJB specific ways and democratizing them, making it available to any component that is a CDI compatible component. So this is things like at asynchronous, which is happening in Jakarta E10, at schedule, lock, max concurrency. Uh, these are all different things that can go into the in, into the concurrency specification. And some of these will make it in, in there. There's already conversations to do to make that happen. Decoupling the uh, message-driven means model from EJB into something called at message listener is something that could potentially happen. Uh, moving things like roles allowed and, and security into Jakarta security and making them CDI compatible. And this is also actually happening as well in, in Jakarta E10. There's also scope for better CDI support in things like uh, REST, batch, and concurrency. And in fact, again, these are all happening in Jakarta E10, if not most certainly in Jakarta E11 as well. Um, there's some, uh, although we've done a lot of work uh, in aligning with Java SC8, there's certain things that actually still remain to some extent. So these are things like adding support for completable feature in concurrency, um, adding support for having a bootstrap API that you can just bootstrap a runtime uh, in Java SE without a Java E runtime. So this is applicable towards the REST APIs, things like Jersey and REST AZ, as well as things like JMS. Uh, so you ought to be able to take a JMS provider and just run it in a Java SE based environment. Uh, decoupling the TCKs, so a lot of the uh, uh, the reason why Jakarta E or Java E is so pervasive is actually a lot of these technologies are usable outside of app servers. So you can take them and just use them uh, in a Java EC based environment. So further, uh, further modularizing the ones that aren't, okay, and making it possible to certify just a particular implementation uh, or just particular part of a particular technology set, a particular spec in, in Jakarta E. Some of that work uh, has been done already, but more of that needs, should, could be done. Uh, and of course, there are standardization gaps, and I'll talk more about those in, in a moment. So there's things like that could be done that are just available today in vendor-specific ways or in third-party components, third-party APIs um, that extend Jak Jakarta E, and these could be brought into Jakarta E itself. So th there's some examples of security, batch, concurrency, persistent transactions. Uh, they all have examples of certain things. And of course, the core and microservices profile. And that is a subset of Jakarta E that is basically applicable and making Jakarta E really work in microservices environments. And I'll talk more about the core microservices profile in, in a moment as well. Uh, and finally, some new APIs. So some these are some examples would be NoSQL, MVC, and configuration. And I'll talk more about each of those in a moment also. So these are some specifics uh, of the standardization gaps that I was talking about. Uh, so some specific examples are being able to define executor services in a vendor neutral way through annotations. And this is actually happening in Jakarta E10. Um, um, being able to propagate the CDI context along with the rest of the context when you're creating managed threads <coughs> in Jakarta E. And again, that's, this is happening in Jakarta E10, uh, adding support for, uh, in, so right now Jakarta Security has support for database authentic authentication and LDAP. Uh, we could add more sort of microservice-y uh, authentication mechanisms also. So this would be things like OpenID Connect and JWT. OpenID Connect is happening in Jakarta E10. Hopefully, now JWT is there in microprofile. Hopefully there is a way to bridge that and bring that into, uh, into Jakarta. Uh, doing Jakarta persistence uh, repositories. And in fact, there's a proposal for a new spec to do exactly that. Uh, in terms of Jakarta REST, using at inject as opposed to at context, which was an old uh, annotation that sort of behaves like CDI, but is not quite CDI. Uh, adding uh, native support for multi-pattern form data. In fact, that is all, this has already happened and it's going to be included in Jakarta E10. Um, adding a job job definition long language uh, as an alter alternative to XML. So this would be writing batch uh, specification configuration in Java. Uh, and this won't make it in Jakarta E10, but certainly will most likely make it in Jakarta E11. Uh, and finally, transactions. 
So when people think about transactions, uh, they really think about uh, two PC only uh, or two phase commit. But the reality of Jakarta transactions in terms of when you look at the implementations is most implementations actually support things like uh, le last resource committed optimizations, local transactions, emulation of, of 2PC and, and a lot of these other uh, other more advanced optimizations effectively, effectively, performance optimizations, and they're relatively commonplace. Um, so it, it only makes sense to actually add those optimizations back to, into the standard as opposed to just keeping them uh, sort of vendor specific. Okay, so we talked about these new standards, so to say. One is Jakarta MVC. Uh, so this is an action-oriented framework approach. Um, that makes it a little bit easier to align with some of the uh, JavaScript heavy front ends as compared with JSF. Uh, and there is actually a standard for this already. It's not quite included in, uh, in the Jakarta platform. In fact, arguably, maybe it shouldn't be. And it should be added. It should be a part of the Jakarta umbrella just the way it is, but available basically standalone and uh, being able to be added to any Jakarta or microprofile runtime. A lot of the work here is actually just putting to, together the existing pieces that are already there in Jakarta. So for the model portion, for example, you could use CDI and be in validation. For the view, you could use facelets and Jakarta server face, faces or JSP. Uh, and really most of the work is in the controller layer. And a lot of the work actually is already done. Uh, there is at least an initial uh, version of the specification available uh, under the Eclipse Foundation. Okay. Jakarta NoSQL is another one that is almost all but done. The only thing that is holding up Jakarta NoSQL from being finalized is another portion that I'll talk about, and that is Jakarta configuration. But other than that, pretty much pretty feature complete <coughs> standard already out there. You can use it. Again, it's part of the Jakarta umbrella, but not included in the platform per se, but certainly usable in microprofile applications as well as Jakarta applications. So basically what this does is that it allows sort of a multi-layer approach, a flexible approach, uh, so that you can use uh, a, a standard, a single API, a consistent API to uh, access various NoSQL data, data stores. Same thing for Jakarta configuration. Um, so this is uh, basically the ability to externalize your application configuration uh, outside uh, of your application in things like property files, job system properties, environment variables, Kubernetes secrets, uh, NoSQL stores and, and the like. So there is already a standard for this and has been, this is one of the oldest standards in microprofile that is now being transitioned into uh, Jakarta so that all of the Jakarta specifications, including things like perhaps persistence uh, and NoSQL can take advantage of this. Um, so this again is already in the works. Um, my suspicion is that there will be a, a, uh, a release of this uh, sooner rather than later this year and it will be included in the Jakarta EE core profile. Okay, so uh, Jakarta, again, I talked about uh, Jakarta EE 8 being a fairly feature complete release for monolithic applications. Uh, and so what we need now is uh, addressing the needs of micro profile developers. So the ecosystem hasn't really been sitting around, you know, trying to figure, the, uh, tr trying for Jakarta to figure this out. Basically, there are technologies out there that are using microprofile and using Jakarta E technologies and making things work for microservices developers in a very, very cloud native way. So some examples of this is Quarkus or Heliton uh, or e even Open Liberty, uh, and also perhaps even things like Micronaut. I'll talk about Micronaut in, in just a moment. But basically, these are all making Jakarta work in a fully cloud native way. Uh, but ba by basically taking a subset of uh, Jakarta standards and uh, treating them as, as a required part in microservices and everything else sort of optional and pluggable. So this is really nothing much more, the core profile is nothing much more than just standardizing that concept. So taking a small handful of Jakarta APIs and saying, okay, this is the core of what you need in order to develop microservices and above and beyond that you add whatever you want in a, in a modular fashion. So the reason I do have Micronaut listed as part of a possible uh, Jakarta e core profile certifi certified implementation is that uh, Micronaut currently is actually involved in what is called CDI Lite. Uh, so that is taking CDI and making it work uh, in, a, in a cloud native uh, cloud native fashion, especially with Graal VM. 
so uh, hopefully once they once micronaut in the process of doing that becomes cdi4 compatible uh, compatible runtime it's not too far to imagine that it can also add support for the rest of these specs namely things like json and, and JaxRS, to become also become a core profile implementation and this basically uh, adds a different dimension to Jakartai altogether in, in terms of what Jakartai can support and what Jakartai runtimes look like in a microservices environment. So all of this, uh, I hope you this interests some and some of this hopefully interests you, and you don't simply need to be interested. You can actually be involved. In in fact, I hope you will be involved. So these are the different ways that you can be involved, uh, and this slide deck is available on. Uh, on speaker on my speaker deck account you can take a look at it and you can explore all of these different ways that you can get involved beginning from just sharing your opinion all the way to actually helping make some of these changes happen hopefully some of the changes that we talked about uh, in the in the Jakarta E10 contributor guide for the ambassadors so in summary uh, Jakarta E8 9 9.1 these are all very important in future proofing Java and, and keeping uh, the technology alive and vibrant for many years to come. Uh, and above and beyond the transition uh, into a truly open source domain, now you will begin to see changes like J the Jakarta Core Profile and all of the some of the changes that I talked about, whether that's NoSQL or enhancements to existing specifications like security and uh, and uh, and persistence, and moving the the platform forward again. Right. begin to actively add new features and, and actively evolve the platform going forward once again. But all of this can happen with you, uh, and I hope uh, one part of what you will take away from this talk here today is to be involved and actually make these changes happen. So I'll finish up with some resources for you. Uh, first of all, the Jakarta One live stream conference, all of those talks are available on YouTube. It's a really good resource to learn more about Jakarta. If you're going to join one community alias, please make it the Jakarta E community alias. A major uh, announcement in the Jakarta E platform and major discussions happen there. Uh, please join up there. If you just follow one uh, Twitter handle, I hope you will <coughs> join the official Jakarta E Twitter handle. If you follow another one, I hope you join um, the. I hope you follow the Jakarta E ambassadors Twitter handle to stay up to date and stay engaged and find out ways of how you can contribute. Uh, to the Jakarta platform. Uh, and finally, uh, another monthly, sort of semi-monthly uh, uh, meetup that is there for Jakarta developers is the Jakarta Tech Talks. And that is something else you could be involved in. So that is it for today. Uh, that is all I can really cover in a, in a short, relatively short 30-minute time span. Uh, I hope this was worth it. Uh, and I hope uh, you will reach back out to me if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, and I hope to hear from you uh, sometime in the future. Thank you very much.